How do you beat Genshin Impact? Genshin is a live service game with updates coming out every six weeks, and the game is meant to be played for months or years at a time, or if you're me, forever. The definition of beating Genshin Impact may change from person to person. Maybe they think it's collecting every single character or weapon, okay rich guy, or maybe it's completing all the Archon and story quests, but the majority of players would say it is completing the Spiral Abyss. A series of combat trials starting from floor one, getting progressively more difficult as you go deeper and deeper within. With the final most difficult level being floor 12, where you need two teams of four completely decked out in high quality weapons, artifacts, and character levels to stand a chance. The Abyss also grades your performance on every floor based on how fast you cleared it from zero to three stars. Clearing the Abyss alone for the first time with minimal stars can take players a range of time. More casual players could take over a year or still haven't cleared it at all. Your average player who plays every day could take maybe six or so months to clear, while a new try-hard player min-maxing and grinding every day could maybe pull it off in two to three months. Which brings us to the challenge today. I set out to beat the Spiral Abyss Floor 12 from a brand new account in just three weeks. But not just beat Floor 12, to beat it in the fastest time possible. The hardest challenge Genshin has to offer to get 36 stars. But isn't Genshin a gacha game? Can't you just throw your wallet at it and call it a day? All right, wise guy, fine. Here are the rules. The account is completely free to play. Not a single cent will be spent on the account. No account rerolls will be done. This means the first account that I make is the account we are using. No making new accounts until we get an early five star for a head start. I also had a soft rule of no co-op unless I absolutely needed it. I only used it twice in this entire challenge and it may have caused more harm than help. Also, if I did decide to use co-op, it would be only with completely random players from the co-op menu. No co-op with viewers or my friends in any way. I did not want my content creator influence to affect this run at all. And finally, I would be live streaming every single second of this challenge, no playing on the account off stream if I could help it. To complete this challenge in this small amount of time, I had to live breathe and sleep Genshin Impact for 21 days straight, pushing myself physically and mentally to the absolute limits. This is the 36 stars in three weeks challenge. I made my new account and the challenge began on February 20th, exactly three weeks before the official cutoff point of the challenge when servers go down and maintenance starts for patch 4.5 on March 12th. So I started my adventure as any new Genshin player would, mashing through Paimon dialogue, going through the story, listening to Venti, Amber, and Lisa's requests, and shooting down a giant dragon in the worst aerial combat known to man. During this time though, I was contemplating on the first big decision of the run, do we pull on the beginner banner? Lots of players will tell you the pulling on the beginner banner is a bait because none of the pulls that you do on this banner will raise your pity like they will on the standard banner or on a limited banner, which is true. But the special thing about this banner is that there are no four star weapons in the pool, meaning we had about a 50% chance to get an amazing character off rip. Beto, Bennett, Fischl, Sucro, Shongling, and Xingqiu were all possibilities, and we need good characters to even stand a chance here, so we did it. Five star! Yes! <laughs> Please give me more than just Noel. Are we really gonna get the the this the bog standard? The bare minimum. You know what, dude? I'll take it again. We got another character. Here. That, that's kind of a win. I didn't have enough yet for our second temple, so I continued to do early game quests, raising my AR, and after getting enough fates, went back to test our luck. I'm ripping it. Five star. No. Okay, just multiple four stars. Multiple four stars. Please. I am begging you. Here we go. Oh. Barbara's here. Barbara's here. Yay! Barbara's here, guys. Barbara's here. <laughs> That's okay. <clears throat> That's all right. Barbara's here. Yeah, getting Barbara is even worse than it looks since Barbara is one of the few characters you get absolutely for free and her constellation one is downright terrible. The gotcha was not kind to us day one, but there are no resets here, so I kept my head held high and pressed on. A lot of these early days involved what you might expect, grinding out the main story quests and exploring the map to unlock TP points, statues of the seven to open up the map, hunting down treasure chests, all to grab some poles and raise up our adventure rank. I was also collecting all the Animaki
calculus since offering them to the Statue of Seven raises your maximum stamina. The more stamina I had, the faster I could traverse the map, saving time, but also I'm gonna need a big stamina bar to dodge as much as possible in the abyss. Also during this stream, something completely shocking happened. Doro44, one of the goats of Genshin content creating, raided my stream. Oh my lord! Doro? The legend? I have never talked to Doro before, so this was completely out of the blue. Thank you so much, homie. And hey, man, I'd love to talk to you more soon. At the end of day two, I had enough standard fates for another temple on standard. Sick, dude, let's fucking go. And a temple on the Yaimiko banner. With just a little bit of saltiness in my heart, we spent our next temples on the Yaimiko banner and ended up with a nice surprise. Yao, yao. Yao, yao. Yao, yao, please. Yes! Let's go. We finally got a dub. We got a character we're actually gonna use. Ningguang, I'll take you. Give me the glitter, baby. Now that we've touched the character banner, there's something I need to explain. The three-week time limit of the challenge does have some significance. It is exactly half a patch, but most importantly, the exact duration of a character's banner. Meaning the whole challenge is contained to just two five-star banners and one weapon banner. So the 4.6 banners we had of Yai, Miko, and Xiao were not too great. Yai, Miko, and Xiao are both all right five stars, but they require a lot of investment and specific teammates to really pop off. And the four stars outside of maybe Yao Yao were not gonna help us out at all. But if you think I made an oopsie doing the challenge with banners like this, you're wrong. I knew this going into the challenge, and I specifically chose to do the challenge on these banners, all right? I wanted to seriously challenge myself to see if I could pull this off without using some of the game's strongest characters. I wanted to see if I could adapt to any situation the game threw at me and create the best teams possible with what I was given. Some may call it cocky, others may call it stupid, but it's what I wanted to do. Now is probably a good time for me to explain my thought process about the teams in this challenge. I firmly believe that planning out your teams to a T before the challenge even started was a massive mistake. Whatever your plans are, the gotcha will take a look at them, light them on fire, and piss on the ashes. So the early mantra of this challenge was pull, then plan. I think the ability to adapt to what the game throws at you and make the best decision with what you're given was what would make or break the challenge. While it may not look like it, this entire challenge was a massive collection of micro decisions made day in and day out. So the reason I was so happy to see Yao Yao was because she's a character I could realistically see myself using at the end of this, whereas Xin Yan and Ning Guang, I could not. My rough tentative plan at this point was to pull the five star on Yai Miko's banner. And if we win or lose, assess from there. Yai Miko can be a high electro damage DPS paired with Yao Yao or Call A for aggravates, or at worst, a decent hyperloop option. So she was definitely the call in my opinion. While a lost 50 50 would be devastating. Xiao is a fine character, but he requires a ton of investment to be good, and his best teammates like Faruzan and Bennett were nowhere to be seen, bar getting insanely lucky from standard down the road, not a risk I was willing to take. These few early days of heavy exploration and questing were when the most primo gems were flying in, so I was expecting we're gonna get our first five star by day five to seven. On day three, we finished the Mondstadt Archon quest, collected all the Animoculus, started exploring Li Wei deeply, hit AR-23, and had a few funny moments along the way. Go, dude! New record! Dandy, you gotta make it harder for me, baby girl! Near the end of the day, I remembered the luxurious heart chest island in Liwei, and I thought it might be fun to grab a random person from co-op to help me get it. Little did I know this would be the biggest mistake I make in the entire challenge. Sup, Blake? I'm very new, XD. Could you help me get the heart chest? Oh my God, he's a pro? Oh my God, a professional gamer is here to help me. Blake, where are you? Are we just going? Blake? All right, he's just gonna make me do all the work. It's okay, Blake, it's all right, bro. The thing is, is Blake is the professional. So I'm just, I'm just a little bit surprised that he's not, you know, contributing to this cryo bridging. <laughs> We're not gonna fucking get there, dude. Is this how they fell in the Titanic? Just drowning? Don't panic, Blake. Oh my God. Oh my God. Kaya! Stand up, Kaya! <laughs> now you switch! Blake, you f***er! Oh my God, he's got trusty hands. Whatever the f sword. He's a pro. 
You can go first, Blake. Day four was another big exploration day, more leeway, and Chen Yu Vale with a little bit of dragon spine. I was also already starting to lose my voice at this point, so that sucked, but at least we got to do a lot of pulls, and the first temple we did changed everything. <sighs> this guy? Bro, are you kidding me? This could have been Fishel. This could have been Bennett. Shangling, Ching, Chosu, Ghost Home, Chevrolet. What the f? Remine. At least it's a brand new Skyrider sword. Energy recharge, elemental burst, 12% attack. But what did the standard banner have in store for us? By the way, all the standard pulls I'm getting are from things like adventure rank rewards, the battle pass, and leveling up every character to get their first ascension. No primos are being used here. Anyway, the standard banner is, well, I'll let Sleep Deprived Eeks rant about it. This banner is where the possibilities are endless any four star in the goddamn game chevris fischl toma bennett shingcho shangling sucrose game changers can pop out of this fucking pool right now i'm even talking sack bow fav bow fav weapons sack weapons wits it anything can happen five star mm, okay come on come the Oh! The, the goat! The goat! We finally got a lucky break, dude! Holy! Yes, dude! The princess in! Ooh, bro, 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 bro! Fischl was the first lucky break we got all run. She is a high damage, electro applying, off field energy generating machine. Fischl is fantastic, and she will almost definitely be on one of the final teams, but she isn't strong enough to hard carry the entire run by herself, and it was too early to start deciding the teams. We did another temple on the Aimiko banner later and got Ningguang again, and after seven hours of grinding, we had yet another temple and got Ningguang is here. I have still never, I've gotten one double four-star pull in the entirety of me playing this entire run. And who would have guessed off standard that we got someone so dear to Fremenet? the bell. <laughs> With how bad the gacha was thus far, it was beginning to become a bit demoralizing. Only one of the first nine ten pulls has netted me more than one four star. And most of the four stars I've gotten are not final team material. On all fronts, it has not been spectacular. You may think I have plenty of time to do more pulls and generate more primos at this stage, which you'd be correct, but a challenge like this is vastly different from a normal account experience. My time and resources are very limited. I only have three weeks of resin to raise up eight weapons, eight characters, talents, and artifacts. You eventually have to fully commit to what teams you're using because you don't have enough resin to make last minute decisions. If I were to get Tainari on the last day of the challenge, he's obviously a great pair with the limited banner character Yai Miko, but there is no possible way I could level him up with a day's worth of resin and talent domain restrictions and somehow have enough artifacts to work on him out of nowhere, he'd end up being useless. Pull then plan is still the golden rule, but getting bad pulls and low amounts of four stars pushes back the ability to plan and planning too late can really hamper for the run. But I did luckily think this out before, and besides a few character materials for Fischl and my main character, all my resin up till now has been spent on Mora. Talents or boss drops for a character I may not end up using at the end of this challenge would be wasted resin, but I knew Mora would never betray me. Stockpiling Mora now so I can use my later resin on all my character specific materials was my plan. But long story short, I was getting stressed that I hadn't gotten enough strong four stars yet since I needed to decide team soon and the looming 50-50 on Yaimiko's banner was still uncertain. I decided on day five after a temple on Yaimiko's banner that netted us a fab bow and got us to 51 pity that I'd save all my pulls from now on on until we had enough to guarantee the five star on Yai Miko's banner around 30 pulls. We completely finished Dragon Spine today, getting all the rewards from the Frostbearing Tree, did the Triumphant Frenzy event, which used rental characters, thank God, to score some extra primos, and started working our way through the Leeway Archon quest, ending the day at AR 29. Day six was set up to be one of the most pivotal days of the entire run. 
we are getting our first five star today. I spent the entire day grinding all the easy primos left, beating up to floor four of the abyss for a big chunk of one time primos and unlocking Shangling and Kale, finishing the Leeway Archon quest, doing a cute Leeway cooking event that was running, and exploring Leeway till the very last moment. All the easy primos from the new account buff from Chen Yu Vale, Dragon Spine, and the Archon quests are about to be exhausted in a one time blaze of glory. Today was a make or break day for a multitude of reasons. The date was February 25th, the last day of Lantern Rite, and I had still not chosen my free four star. Looking at the list of characters, the extremely obvious pick is Xing Cho. He's one of the strongest and most versatile characters in the game, so why not snap pick him? Well, February is ending soon, and the Paimon's Bargains Glitter Shop will be changing on March 1st, where Xing Cho becomes available through glitter. So would it just be better to not get Xing Cho from Lantern Rite, get him from Paimon's Bargains, and choose a a different free four star. There were really only four actual choices when it came to characters impactful enough for a run like this. I already have both Yao Yao and Shangling, and their early constellations are not anything special, so they weren't considered either. That left just Xing Cho and Beto. Xing Cho, as we discussed, is available next month through Glitter, and Beto is not only a very viable Electro DPS that synergizes with the Aimiko, Fischl, Kale, or Yao Yao, but she's currently in the Paimon shop right now. So do we take Beidou from Lantern Rite and get Xing Cho from the shop next month, or do we grab the Xing Cho now and save all the glitter and don't pick Beidou at all? All of these possibilities were running through my head, but there was one big thing we needed to do before we could make either of these decisions, and it all came down to this. The 50% chance for success or the 50% chance for disaster to dictate the entire future of the run. If we do not get Yai Miko, I will most likely not pull on the limited banner anymore for this entire challenge maybe i change my mind in the future but guys getting all the way up to 75 pulls again with these four stars it's not being worth it 75 come on I was honestly crushed. I felt like the luck had already been pretty rough towards me the whole run, and this was just icing on the cake. He's useless! He doesn't help at all! I think we got this. With a million different thoughts flowing through my head, I said to my stream that I didn't think pulling on the limited banner was worth it anymore. To grind up 75 pulls, to climb all the way up to pity, getting useless four stars along the way, just didn't seem worth it. With the characters I had right now, adding Yai Miko to the roster was not just gonna fix everything. I thought with my back against the wall, we'd need real tangible difference makers to come from every single Primo gem. Those being the weapon banner to power up the characters I already had, like Stringless for Fischl or Fablance for Yao Yao, or gambling on the slot machine that is the standard banner. And on top of all of this stress, I had to choose my Lantern Rite character tonight. What was the most pivotal moment of the challenge, the Yai Miko 50-50, was finished. And nothing was going to change that now. With no time to rest or think, I was immediately presented with another run-altering decision. Do I choose the safe, guaranteed to be used on the final team Shig Cho, or the strong Electro DPS in Beto? I was still not close to deciding my final teams yet. Xing Cho is so versatile that he can find his way onto any team comp, but Beto, on the other hand, would practically lock me in now to using an Electro and Dendro Aggravate team on one side of the Abyss, and I wasn't sure if I was able to make that commitment right now. And if I chose Xing Cho now, I'd probably lose my chance to get Beto from the shop since I needed 16 more Master of Star Glitter, the equivalent of getting eight four-star weapons or four-star constellations in just four days. I spent my leftover primos on standard for the next four-star just so I could have as much information as possible before deciding, and I got Hazo, which didn't really change much at all. Who needs Shao when you got Hazo? In the end, I decided on the safe option of Xing Cho leaving the Beto option behind and pressing forward with a new strong weapon in our arsenal. Whether we run a shoddy Hyper Bloom team with Xing Cho as the driver or a Shangling national team with Xing Cho and Shangling Vaporize, he will find a place on these final teams, so I felt confident in the decision. What I didn't feel so confident about was the future of this run. At this point, we had Deluke, Fischl, Xing Cho, 
all the free-to-play characters available to us, our Traveler, of course, and a random assortment of four stars that most of which will go unused. While we definitely had some options available to us for the final teams, I tried to delay the decision until we got our standard banner five star. With characters like Kaching and Tainari still possibilities, I kept a clear head and grinded endlessly like I always do to get closer to the finish line. Day seven started with me clearing up some unfinished business at Dragonspine, massively exploring Chen Yu Vale for more treasure and world quest EXP, of course, but most importantly, the spirit carbs. The reason why I focused in on Dragonspine and Chen Yu Vale is for a simple reason. The frost bearing tree and the cart bearing ring give a ton of useful rewards. They each give a ton of adventure rank EXP, which I haven't been talking about much in this video because, well, it's boring, but it's extremely imperative to the run. Every single day, I need to be raising my adventure rank as much as I can since I need to raise my world level for better drops, but I also need to get to AR 50 before the end of the challenge so I can get my characters to level 90. But besides adventure rank EXP, you get Mora, crowns, character EXP, billets, and oh yeah, free pulls. This was yet another way I was grinding standard pulls throughout the journey. About four hours into day seven, I did a standard temple that got us a fav codex. And after three more hours of grinding, we did one more and got... <gasps> Chevrus? Chevrus! This is huge! Chevrus out of nowhere was exactly what we needed to bring this run back from the dead. Just listen to what I said before doing that exact temple. It's time for a comeback. Because we've been through hell and back. So right here, right now, we're going to change the game, baby. Chevrus, Kuki, Toma, Bennett. Game changers are on the way. Here we go! If you may not understand why Severus is such a massive deal, let me break it down for you. Severus is an absolutely insane support character, one that rivals characters like Bennett and Kazuha in certain situations. When Shev is in a team of only Pyro and Electro characters, her first Ascension passive shreds enemy Pyro and Electro resistance by 40% after being hit by an overload reaction. 40% resistance shred is the same buff as Viridescent Venom, one of the most meta-shaping artifact sets in all of Genshin and the reason why Animo is good to this day. But this automatically shreds both Pyro and Electro Res, while Chev is completely off field and doesn't require her to hold a specific artifact set. Not to mention her second passive, which raises the entire team's attack by up to 40% after she fires an overcharged ball from her skill. What we need from our characters in this run is immense value and Chevrus provides so much in just one character and one other thing Chevrus did upon her arrival was completely single-handedly bring Deluc back as a viable option for our final teams Deluc, Chevrus, and one more pyro or electro teammates has easily solidified itself as one of the final teams we will be using to clear floor 12 after Chevrus's entrance seemingly solved half the team issues alone, my outlook on the challenge's future had completely changed. Also, the option of going back in for Yai Miko now that she's guaranteed was way more enticing since she'd worked great with Chevrus too. An account that one day prior was a depressing, hopeless wasteland that the gotcha left in its wake was now full of optimism with a positive and motivated Ix at the helm. Day eight was an all out Inazuma exploring bonanza. We of course started the quest to have Beto give us a lift over to Inazuma, escaped from Rito, spent too long in a bugged Kanda village for the sacred Sakura quest, went on a date with Aika, prison broke with Yoimiya and pissed off Raiden Shogun all for those juicy pulls waiting for us at the sacred Sakura tree. So after a seven hour grind day, we went up two adventure rank levels and got another temple on standard. We are 58 into pity on the standard banner. This could change everything. Maybe we get something early. Maybe we get a four star that will break the entire game open. This challenge relies a little too much on gotcha for my taste, but I think you guys like that. Here we go. Can't say I'm surprised. Oh my God. Oh! This is the moment where the run would completely shift its course. Kuki is yet another one of the absolute game-changing four stars we could have gotten. She is invaluable for one simple reason, Hyperbloom. 
Hyperbloom is a team comp in Genshin known to be extremely strong for very little investment. The only caveat is it requires very specific characters to make it work consistently, and Kuki Shinobu is one of those characters. Hyperbloom involves creating blooms and then popping them with Electro, which may sound easier said than done, but to create consistent blooms, you need a Dendro character reacting with Shincho's Hydro application and usually an off-field Electro character whose abilities will actually hit the seeds. Characters like Fischl and Oz don't aim for the seeds seeds and rarely, if ever, hit them, and the same goes for Yai and Miko's turrets. The two strongest Electro characters for Hyperbloom by leaps and bounds are Raiden Shogun, who obviously was not an option, and through sheer dumb luck, a Kuki Shinobu out of nowhere off standard. We now had the two teams completely fleshed out, a Chevrus Overload team for side one, and a Hyperbloom team led by Kuki and Xing Cho for side two. Earlier, I said the run had completely shifted course now, and that was not an exaggeration. The stress of the gacha was effectively over. Yai Miko is guaranteed to come home eventually with everything up to pity as a bonus, and after obtaining Kuki, I realized there wasn't a single standard banner 5 star that would change our teams. Yes, even Tainari combined with Yai Miko wouldn't switch me off of Chevrus Overload and Hyperbloom. So with that, we officially entered phase two of the project, trying to build up our teams as much as we possibly could in just 13 days. Over a couple days of racking my brain constantly on and off stream, bouncing ideas off of people in chat, and my good friend Mike, my roommate, I think we had a solid outline for the teams. Every single weapon, artifact set, character, and talent level were planned to a T, because in just 13 days, resources were scarce, and every decision counts. First, we have the Hyperbloom team led by Kuki. As the one causing the Hyperbloom reactions with her skill, she wants nothing but elemental mastery. Hyperbloom damage scales off of the Electro character's level and their elemental mastery. This is why Hyperbloom is seen as a low investment team. My plan was to have Kuki on four piece Gilded Dreams or two piece EM sets with triple EM main stats. And for her weapon, she'd hold the completely free to play Iron Sting for the simple reason that it grants her the most elemental mastery we can get. Her character level had to be maxed to 90 for Hyperbloom damage and her talents were actually not necessary at all. Healing is only good if you're taking damage and on floor 12 versus the Ruin Serpent, Wee Nut, and Aeon Blight Drake, I don't plan on getting hit. Xing Cho would be built as close to a standard Xing Cho as we could get him. A four piece emblem set for energy recharge and damage, holding the also completely free to play Fluve Sandra Ferryman. The only hill we had to climb for the Ferryman was doing a ton of fishing in Fontaine to unlock the weapon itself and get its refinements. While this was time consuming and we didn't have much time to waste, the weapon was just too perfect for Xing Cho to pass up and it was worth the investment. And for his talents, we'll be leveling up his skill and burst as much as we can. For the Hyperbloom team's Dendro Applicator, I went back and forth between Yao Yao and Dendro Traveler. Yao Yao is an amazing healer and we have a few constellations on her as well, but her Dendro application can be a bit inconsistent with Yuegwe positioning and her burst, and once again, the healing just didn't matter. So in the end, we went with Dendro Traveler for a few key reasons. Dendro Traveler, plain and simply, does a lot more damage than Yao Yao. Hyperbloom is great and all, but for 36 stars in three weeks, we needed as much team damage as we could get, and DMC's damage is pretty decent compared to Yao Yao's non-existent damage. The Traveler also has a massive boon that you may have overlooked. The Traveler's Ascension materials are given to you through Adventure Rank Rewards. So just by deciding to use Lumine, we end up saving an entire character's worth of resin on boss materials. Dendro Traveler will be on Deepwood Memories to boost up our Hyper Blooms and hold a Sacrificial Sword that we got on our way up to Yaimiko on Day 9. For Talents, her Burst and Skill will up our damage, so we'll take them as high as we can. For the final slot on Hyper Bloom, we needed a teammate that did a lot of damage without messing up our Hyper Blooms, so we decided on none other than the Princessin Derva Earth long official. Fischl was chosen for a few important reasons. Her damage, her energy generation, electro resonance, and of course, her ability to shoot down the Aeon Blight Drake with her charge shots. She'd rock four-piece Gilded Dreams or whatever two-piece damage sets we can muster, and her weapon would be option selected between the Favonius bow we have now or a stringless for more damage if we're able to score one off the weapon banner. And we'll be raising her skill talent as much as possible for that big Oz damage. Now the Chevreuse team is where things got interesting. Chevreuse and her vast carpet bag of benefits also had another benefit. She was very easy to build. All we needed to do was get her to level 70 for her Ascension 4 passive and stack as much HP as we could on her. So we chose Black Tassel, a three star polearm that grants HP percent. And because it's a three star, it takes even less materials and resin to level up. Her artifact set truly didn't matter much. We just wanted her on whatever pieces had HP main stats. As for her talents, Chev wouldn't be doing any meaningful damage for the 
the team, and her heal was decent even at level 1, so we didn't focus much on these. Now is where things got interesting. With Deluke online and Yai Miko being a perfect member of this team, we needed a fourth that would wrap things up nicely. We picked up a Rain Slasher in the same temple as Chevrus actually, and while it seems like an odd Deluke choice, it couldn't be more perfect. As we've said time and time again, the builds for this challenge are gonna be scuffed. I'm not gonna be getting 80% crit, 200% crit damage builds on my characters. It's just not happening. We need a way to get high damage out of the game that doesn't rely on crit stats where we can, like the Hyper Bloom team. So that gave birth to the Max Elemental Mastery Overload Deluke. Deluke has the unique ability of applying a lot of pyro with his skill, burst, and infused auto attacks all at the click of a button. Meaning when paired with an off-field electro applicator like Yai Miko, it would be very easy to overload most of Deluke's hits, letting us focus on overload damage specifically by stacking EM and raising his character levels to max instead of worrying about his crit ratios. And if you're sitting there thinking, isn't overload garbage one of the worst reactions in the game? Sit down. Eek's gotta teach you some stuff. Overload has long been seen as a bad reaction for two simple, misinformed reasons. It blasts enemies away from you, which is very annoying for a team that wants to keep the enemy nearby, and it doesn't do very much damage. This challenge has one singular goal, beat floor 12. And the enemies in this Abyss 12 are so heavy that most of them aren't gonna be moving from the overloaded reaction whatsoever. So that reason is null and void. And for the low damage argument, this is just straight up not true. Hyperbloom and Burgeon have a reaction multiplier of three times, which is the highest we have in the game, while Overload has a very respectable multiplier of two times, tied for the second highest with Raw Bloom, above reactions like Electro Charge and Swirl. And keep in mind, Hyperbloom and Burgeon require three elements to create, while Overload only needs two, Pyro and Electro. So yes, while Overload isn't the highest damage reaction in the entire game, to call it bad damage-wise is wrong. To ensure Deluke overloads almost every single hit he does, we need another Electro character to keep the Electro application coming, and hopefully one that can provide even more general team damage, but who? There was only one perfect option for this team on this floor 12, a character we left marooned. A character we passed up on just a few days ago would now become the perfect fourth slot for the run-saving team, Beto. With just a few days left until Beto left the glitter shop for good, we had to make a mad dash to get 34 glitter to bring her home or the entire strategy might fall apart from under us. So I may have been lying when I said the gotcha was pretty much over. While what we specifically get doesn't matter too much, we need a certain quantity of four star pulls to net us enough glitter. And if we get the bog standard luck of only one four star per temple, it may not be enough. We had just two days to get eight masterless star glitter. Any new character we pulled would not reward us with any glitter at all, so that Zinyan that we've avoided up until this point is getting even scarier. So day 9 and 10 were once again going to be complete marathons, trying to scrounge up as many Primo gems as we could. Day 9 was going to be a long day, so I started off by reminiscing about the best steak I ever had in my life a few days before the challenge started to remind me just how beautiful the world can be after I'm done playing Genshin in a basement for 8 hours a day. But the plan is simple. Grind Inazuma Exploration along with the Archon Quest for Story Progression and Sacred Sakura Fates. Every pull counts here because we need this glitter. We had enough for 2 10 pulls on the Yaimiko banner, netting us the Sack Sword I mentioned earlier in Dendro Main Character section, a huge pickup, with the second giving us a Yao Yao. That's 4 glitter, so we take those. Since we were one pull away from another 4-star, we YOLO'd it and got an off-banner Sucrose. Sucrose is an amazing character, but she was not strong enough to shake up my current team. Especially since without her C1 and Sacrificial Fragments, she was not going to be operating at max potential. And since Sucrose was a new character, that meant no glitter. So the pulls ended with a 4 glitter gain, leaving 4 glitter left to get by tomorrow, which was very nerve-wracking. I was able to farm up even more pulls before day 9 ended, but I decided to save them for tomorrow. Amidst the stress, something amazing happened on day 9 though. It was the day we hit 50k subscribers on YouTube, a goal that I have been chasing for the entirety of last year. So while this was a few weeks back now, I still want to say thank you so much to anyone who watches our videos. Making videos like this seriously is what I've always dreamed of, so from the bottom of my heart, Thank you guys so much for supporting the channel. I appreciate you guys very, very much. Our 50K celebration stream is on the channel right now, so check it out. But the live celebration was short-lived because I still had a mission and nothing was going to get in the way of clearing this challenge. After struggling to clear some lower floors of the Abyss, exploring Leeway and more of that cooking event, we had enough primos for a temple on the Yai Miko banner and four singles on standard. Immediately after the temple starts, this can go. That was the worst. 
possible outcome. On the final day with our backs against the wall, Xinyan reared her ugly, no glitter giving head, making me lose a lot of hope. This was probably the happiest I've ever been to pull an eye of perception. The extra two glitter out of nowhere was massive. If we could just pull one more four star that fits the glitter requirements out of these now five standard pulls from getting Xinyan, this insane stress of the day would be over and give us a much needed mental break. And so we pulled. Four star, five star. Any, yes, yes, yes. Oh my God, this is an early four star. Come on. It doesn't matter, baby, that's Beto. With a lucky Dragon's Bane, Beto was now secured on the last possible day to bring her home. With now every single piece of our teams in order, the gotcha was no more. All right, I lied again. Remember how earlier in the video I was talking about how important our five star on standard was gonna be? Well, that completely changed when we got Kuki and Chevrus and we kind of forgot about it. But we were now at 73 pity on standard, so our five star was coming home today. We unfortunately had a low chance of this five star making a difference for the account though. None of the five star characters we could obtain would change our teams at all, so they'd end up being nothing but a waste. While the standard weapons, on the other hand, were a different story. Things like Harp for Fischl, Pride or Wolf's Gravestone for Beto, or even Skyward Blade for Shing Cho would be absolute wins. So, at the 77th pull, our five star came home. Yes! Oh my God, I'll take it! Let's go! 10 in glitter? And the character we're using in our run? While it wasn't a five star weapon, Deluc was funnily enough, the best case scenario, hands down. Not only are we using him on our final team, so his C1 small damage boost was actually useful, but we also got 10 Masterless Star Glitter out of the pull since he wasn't a new character. So with the full team in order after a very lucky two days, our overload team was ready to be built. Chevreuse we already went over earlier, Black Tassel, max HP artifacts, enough said. But since Deluke's role on the team would be to mainly do damage through overload reactions, he needed to be level 90 and have as much elemental mastery as possible. Rain Slasher was the perfect weapon choice for him, raising damage versus electro-affected enemies, but also giving 165 EM. For artifacts, the goal was the same as Kuki, aiming for four-piece Gilded Dreams, but anything granting EM will do, also on triple EM main stats. Unlike Kuki though, Deluke's talents make a sizable difference in his damage, so we'll actually be leveling them up as much as we can. Yai Miko would be on a very standard DPS build, having her on four-piece Gilded Dreams, but her weapon was still currently up in the air. We had a Fav Codex in our arsenal from earlier gacha, and it wasn't a bad option at all. While Deluke and Chev don't need the energy, both Yai and Beto love the extra particles. Yai can function on low energy builds, but Beto is a character that needs her burst up off cooldown to reach her max potential. So Fav Codex would help with that, but there were still some other options. With the glitter from Deluke's miraculous C1 pull, we could realistically aim to buy Black Cliff Agate from the shop. While it's nothing special, it is a stat stick to raise up Yai Miko's damage, but there was also still a chance of getting a lucky Widsith off the weapon banner late into the run. While all three had their merits, I didn't have to make the decision now, since we didn't even have Yai Miko yet, and we still needed glitter and pulls to make two out of these three options even possible. But we'd be taking Yai Miko's talents as high as possible, ignoring her normal attack. And finally, Beto's build would be a cool one. Beto's most important stat besides crit and attack is energy recharge. A Beto with low ER ends up being complete dead weight most of the time. So after weighing all the options available to us, Katsura Gikiri Nagamasa, the craftable Inazuma Claymore was the perfect fit. With a solid base attack, energy recharge is the substat, and a passive that generates even more energy for Beto, it seemed like a no brainer. It was also completely free to play. And unlike Iron Sting, we were aiming to get this craftable to R5. Luckily the game does hand out a few free Claymore billets and bullet troves, so we had this secured without relying on weekly boss drop luck. Her artifact set would be Emblem of Severed Fate, and her talents would be raised with the priority of her burst first, and her skill if we were able, ignoring the normal. And with that, the team roadmap was completed on day 10, with just a few loose ends to tie up on the fly as we progress further. Eight characters sharing just three different artifact sets, Gilded Deepwood and Emblem, rocking four to five completely free-to-play weapons, and a few four-star gacha weapons we picked up along the way. I really thought that once we had the teams locked in, I'd be able to take it a little bit easier each day up till the Abyss run since I had all my characters, my weapons, I wouldn't need to grind as much anymore, right? God was I wrong. The day at the start of day 11 was March 1st. More importantly, it was a Friday, meaning the weekly reset was approaching that Sunday night and we needed to hit AR45 before then. 
The weekly bosses of Genshin Impact, like Dvalin or Ajdaha, can only have the rewards claimed once a week. So in a three-week challenge, they were a prime suspect to bottleneck the account. To get a character's talent level above six, it requires specific weekly boss materials, and if you don't have those specific materials, you're shit out of luck. There is nothing you can do to raise your talents any higher, capping your potential damage. And if I haven't said it enough, damage is going to be pretty important. As it stands, I'm currently AR 40, meaning I'm world level 5. At world level 5, when you complete a weekly boss, you receive one boss-related talent material per clear, but you can only clear one specific weekly boss once a week. So if I wanted to get Yaimiko's skill and burst to level 8, for example, that would take four weekly boss drops. At my world level, I'm only receiving one. And I haven't even mentioned that you may not get the specific boss drop you need. Every weekly boss has three different materials they can drop, and if you get one of the boss drops your character doesn't need, you're once again completely screwed. Luckily, the bosses drop what's called Dream Solvent, which lets you change one specific boss drop of the same boss to another, but they only drop 33% of the time, and after my week one clears, I have zero. If I'm able to get to the next world level at AR45 before Sunday night ends, it adds a 55% chance to get an extra boss drop, so the possibility of two boss materials instead of one. This may not seem like a big deal, but it is. It's a big deal, man. I've only got one chance at this, and I'm 100 hours deep into this challenge, all right? So I've got to do everything I can to give me an advantage, and that's what I did. The race to AR-45 starts now. Huge day tomorrow, man. I've got to hit AR-45 by tomorrow for the weekly bosses. Gamers, hello. I believe it is day 12. I woke up, I was ready to play all day because I got to get AR-45, it's Sunday, the weekly reset's gonna happen and our internet is dead. I have no idea why and our internet service provider does not know either. So I am on my way to Roger's house because I, I have to play on this account today. I have to get our adventure rank up. I cannot let the project die. This is ridiculous. I will keep you guys updated. That's right. After 12 days in a row of streaming, my internet blacked out for no reason, and our ISP wouldn't arrive to check on it until 4 p.m. With no time to waste, I headed over to Rogers because stream or not, I have a massive mountain to climb today, and nothing will stop me from doing everything in my power to beat this challenge. When I finally got to Rogers, an even more unpredictable road bump was waiting for us. Hey there, everybody. So, I'm here in Rogers DX Racer, Gamer Kingdom. He's even got Her Excellency. He's got three monitors. He's got this really cool keyboard that I'm sure is very ergonomic. The email that I used for this account has been banned. Of course, I made a brand new email that I, that I don't use very, uh, right? It's just for this and it's banned. So I can't get into it to get the verification code to log into the account. So I, I don't know, man. So I got to drive back home to, I guess, play off of Wi-Fi hotspot. This is a nightmare. Screw you, Gmail, for thinking that I'm a bot, bro. I will see you guys on the other side. So that's what we did. We drove home after wasting an hour and a half of daylight to try and salvage the run the only way we could. Playing from my desktop downstairs that we gave internet access off of my phone's Wi-Fi hotspot. Keep in mind, like a true gamer, I play in the basement. So the phone service was spotty at best. If I decided to open up any other tab on my computer for entertainment, like a YouTube video or podcast, Genshin would immediately start to lag uncontrolled. Alina let me borrow her phone to entertain myself, so bless her heart, but needless to say, this was an absolute cluster. Cluster or not, I played for 12 straight hours, endlessly grinding the Sumeru Archon quest to get as much adventure rank EXP as I possibly could. With the clock eventually hitting midnight, then 1 a.m., then 2 a.m., I started to realize it wasn't gonna be enough. 
knowing I still needed to do my weekly bosses nonetheless. At around 2.30 a.m. local time with the reset at three, I cleared the three weekly bosses for my team. Yae uses Makoto drops, Fischl and Shing Cho use drops from Boreas, while Deluc and Beto use drops from Devalin. Luckily, the drop we got from Devalin and Boreas was a usable one for one of our team members, but unfortunately, the Makoto drop was not the one Yae Miko needed. And to my dismay, we didn't get a single Dream Solvent, making us zero for six on a 33% chance for Dream Solvent drops so far. After not being able to stream to my viewers, feeling like I let them down for part of the challenge, grinding off stream for 12 hours straight, coming up short of the AR45 goal by the end of the week, making our boss drops worse, and with zero Dream Solvents to show for it, I dejectedly went to bed, exhausted, and disappointed in the progress I'd made thus far. The next day was day 14, exactly two weeks into our three week challenge, so it was an apt day to complete what we couldn't hit yesterday, AR45. After that though, the day was relatively uneventful in comparison to some, but as always, we did some things imperative to the success of the run. I started by doing some pulls I'd built up from the day prior, optimistically doing single pulls in case the Aimiko came home early so as to not waste any more pulls than necessary on the ban. Of course, that was a waste of time with no early Yae to be seen, but on the day, we did net ourselves another Ningguang, Eye of Perception, Yao Yao, and a Fav Codex, putting our Codex at R2 if we decide to use it. We had standard pulls built up and actually got C1 Chevrus against all odds, which is not as hype as it sounds. It's not a very strong con, but it's something. Alina and Nyla made a cameo to help us pull Stringless, meaning we now had a strong DPS weapon for Fischl if we chose to run that over Fab. Just look at this snapshot of the moment. What a perfect family. We started to learn how to fish for Xingqiu Sword. I won't bore you with the details, but it's a lot of fish over a lot of days. Since I was avoiding co-op, I had to get started ASAP so my fish would respawn in time to R5 it myself. We also started the R&R quest to unlock the Great Onion Tree, found the recipe for Katsuragi Nagamasa and crafted one, and of course, spent our resin to power up the team. Now is a good time to mention another shift in our strategy as we approach the later phases of the challenge. So Yae Miko, she's guaranteed, right? We already lost the 50-50, so she is guaranteed to come home eventually. As long as I plan out my farming for Yae Miko materials properly, the difference between getting Yae Miko today and getting her five minutes before we enter the abyss on the final day is non-existent. And to bring her home, it won't cost every single primo gem left in the game, meaning I had extra gems to throw around. So with the combination of her being guaranteed, having enough primos to bring her home with more to spare, and no rush to bring her home ASAP, this began an extremely impactful change in the account spending primo gems on resin refreshes resin your gotcha game time gated energy resource is everything in Genshin impact it's what keeps us coming back and logging in every single day because it recuperates over time well not to beat a dead horse but in a challenge only lasting three weeks that means we only have 21 days worth of resin to spend which we would be hard pressed to make any meaningful progress with that alone so with resin refreshing spending primo gems for resin we can effectively gain weeks or even months of extra resin for the account the ability to start using primo gems for resin is an extremely powerful tool since we already have the characters and weapons we need factoring in the bare minimum primos we need to bring yaimiko home of course we now have the ability to start supercharging our progress so with the added benefits of resin refreshing steady progress was being made towards our teams day by day but there was something up till this point missing from our recipe an ingredient so potent to the success of the run that some could say it was the difference between hope and despair that ingredient was five star artifacts now, it's no secret that artifacts are one of the biggest ways to affect your character's builds. These random trinkets hold the chance to boost your character's most vital stats to new heights or do almost nothing at all. But getting five-star artifacts and getting good ones at that was always up to chance. You see, once you hit AR45, you unlock the domain difficulty rank that guarantees you at least one five-star artifact per 20 resin, the golden standard for farming in Genshin. Prior to AR45, five-star artifacts at best had a 35.5% chance of showing up and do to four star artifacts being significantly weaker than their five star counterparts spending resin on artifacts before ar45 would be a bad idea to put it lightly now if only we had a huge surplus of resin we could just blow all on artifacts right now then maybe we could oh yeah we've been saving every single fragile resin in the game for this exact moment 61 fragile resin was funnily enough almost the exact amount of natural resin you get in three weeks so with an entire month's worth of resin in our pockets it was time to create the finishing touches to our character's build we embarked on a five hour grind session to bring our character's builds to life so the tentative plan was this 
farmed the Gilded Dreams Deepwood Domain until we had some adequate builds on our key units, and then switched to farming Emblem of Severed Fate Shiminawas, all while strongboxing Emblem of Severed Fate with any extra pieces. I felt this was the most optimal way to spend our resin since we wanted both sets from both domains. Gilded is a no-frills artifact set. It gives elemental mastery, and it gives attack. Two stats that all of our damage characters would enjoy. Deluke and Kuki needed the EM subs, while Yae and Fischl enjoyed both. But when you get down to it, Gilded Dreams provides stats. That's it. Which is great for a run like this. The teams we have built don't rely on fancy effects like Blizzard Shrayer or Viridus and Venerer to succeed. If we got four-piece sets for our DPS characters, that would be great. But if not, they would be fine just running whatever gave them the most raw stats. But Deepwood, while we only needed one set of it for DMC, was going to be necessary to boost up our Hyperbloom damage to its max potential. What we did specifically need to hit, however, was at least two sands, two goblets, and two circlets, all with the Elemental Mastery main stat. This was nowhere near free, as Elemental Mastery is the rarest main stat in the game, appearing on 10% of sands, 4% of circlets, and only 2.5% of goblets. So these six pieces were going to be musts. Another key piece we were aiming for, besides the obvious attack percent sands and Elemental Goblets for our DPSs, was an Energy Recharge Sands for Dendro main character. DMC, while a strong Dendro applicator can struggle to really provide enough dendro for the team without her burst up at all times so this was a must so with the plan in motion it was time to farm and here is where i actually decided to try and use co-op because at this point in the run my characters were actually really weak and i wanted to be able to beat this domain in a reasonable amount of time funnily enough i was scared to even do co-op here so the validity of my run wouldn't be questioned but turns out waiting to join co-op finding people and picking characters wasted a lot of time. And with all due respect to these lovely people I co-opted with for these two or so runs, we weren't exactly popping off in terms of speed. So I said, yeah, screw this. Power leveled Chev, Deluke, Kuki, and Fischl in about an hour and actually made them strong enough to clap the domain at a good speed. This was an extremely long and stressful day with a few ups and a lot of downs. We got lucky with an early Dendro Goblet on Deepwood for DMC and an EM Goblet on Deepwood 2. We weren't gonna be picky about the sets that our EM pieces are on we should be thankful we got some in the first place and just a little after that we were blessed with an er sands on deepwood the second big objective off our list we were getting pretty decent pieces here and there including a juicy attack sands for yai miko but we have five characters to build from this domain so the stakes were high and i didn't feel like we were making enough progress to cool off we went to the strong box to get started on some emblem pieces for shing cho and beto but besides a random em circlet which is great we didn't get anything else we leveled up an hp sands for chev that rolled like a monster and even even got a lucky break with the rolls on that gilded attack percent sands for Yai Miko. We went back in and got a lot of garbage, but eventually got a miraculous EM circlet on gilded, a god piece for Kuki or Deluke. After four continuous hours of grinding and our fragile resin dwindling, we did some more emblem strongbox and got one good piece, but after this, decided that gilded deepwood was providing diminishing returns. DMC already had enough pieces for a solid build, while we still needed emblem builds and two piece Shiminawas was a perfect glue set for our builds anyway. But after an hour and a half, of emblem runs that didn't amount to much, it was time to call it a day. Being completely honest, I know artifacts have a ton of variants, but I think the luck yesterday was pretty poor. Around 50 fragile resin was used in total since I kept a cushion for any unforeseen materials we made it on the spot, and we only got maybe 15 really strong pieces when we needed 40 pieces to fully build out our character. I promised I wasn't delusional thinking we were just going to be swimming in amazing pieces, but I could see the tangible impact that that 50 fragile resin made on the account. And it was honestly alarming how little progress we really made. But even though the fragiles had been spent, the run was far from over. Over the next six days, I never gave up for a second. I was constantly grinding every single second to push the account forward. Yai Miko ended up coming home on day 16, but she immediately had some work to do. These were days of non-stop focus, planning, and micromanaging to prepare us for the final days. Every single day involved me checking all the weapon and talent materials available to farm, cross-checking them with every weapon and character we had so we wouldn't waste a single resin. We farmed overworld monsters, world bosses, and local specialties for all eight characters and weapons we had, making sure every weapon was at their max potential, unlocking every bullet trove in the game to get R5 Katsura Gikiri Nagamasa, and let's not forget fishing constantly to R5 Floof Sanja Ferryman. And of course, theory crafting and making the best of what we could with the artifacts we had and farming even more with whatever resin I could spare. All of this was being done while continuing to grind our conquest and world exploration to complete the final mountain of the journey, reaching AR-50. 
You have to get to AR-50 to get your weapons level 90 and your characters level 90 with their final ascension. Both Daluk and Kuki rely on transformative reactions, Overload and Hyperbloom, for their damage, so character level 90 was required. And getting your weapons level 90 is one of the lowest resin, highest impact things you can do in terms of upping your damage. So these, just like any day of the challenge, were high stakes, nerve wracking days, but they were also filled with so much hype and excitement. Everyone who was invested in this journey, watching and rooting for me, wanted to see us win. And so did I. I had been living this game for three weeks straight. Every moment I wasn't on stream playing for eight hours a day, I was constantly thinking about the plan for tomorrow, my builds, my rotations, my teams, anything I could think about to give me an edge for the next day, I was. So knowing that everything we worked for up until now was about to be put to the test, with no luxury to redo any mistakes or decisions we made during these three weeks was exhilarating. But the pressure was also crushing. We gave ourselves two days to attempt to clear the abyss. The second to last day of the challenge and the final day, Tuesday, March 12th, was only about a half day since the servers would shut down at around 5 p.m. Eastern time. That final day though was there just in case as a cushion. My plan from the beginning was to clear the abyss on the second to last day and not have to mess with that half day at all. So before the final battle, let me show you all the progress we made leading up to it. After terrible weekly boss luck over and over again, on day 19, we finally got a lucky break going three for three on dream solvents from Devalin, Boreas, and Makoto, which was the perfect amount paired with the materials we had up till now to get Luke skill to seven, DMC's burst to seven, Beto burst to eight, Fischl's Oz to 8, Yai Miko's skill to 8, and pretty much every other useful damage skill to 6. For our builds, the two main carries of the entire run, Deluke and Kuki, were looking strong. Deluke reached 886 elemental mastery on Tupi's Shimi, Tupi's Gilded, with Rain Slasher and good talent. While Kuki reached a massive 987 elemental mastery on Tupi's Wanderer's Troop, Tupi's Gilded, rocking Iron Sting. Her Hyper Blooms were going to hit hard. The next most important DPS after those two was Yai Miko, and she had to be one of the most impressive builds we had on the entire account. In just three weeks, Yai Miko had 78% crit rate and 164% crit damage with a Wid Sith we got on day 17 and four piece Gilded Dreams. Chevreuse was where she needed to be with a respectable 33k HP on four piece emblem just because the pieces worked out. Dendro Traveler ended up with a surprisingly high DPS build all while having 240% energy reach charge with Sack Sword on Deepwood. Xingqiu, Beidou, and Fischl though were all on pretty copium builds. Their crit stats were all pretty terrible, but were on weapons, artifact sets, and talent levels that were quite optimal. Trust me when I say I spent every hour min-maxing, leveling, and foddering every possible artifact I could. I did my best with just three weeks time. Unfortunately, these three characters' artifacts just weren't quite there. But every single weapon was level 90, except for Black Tassel. Oh, and Traveler Saxor was stuck at 89, even after feeding every other weapon on the account to it. Unlucky. So after everything we've been through through these last three weeks and some final touches, it was time to take on the Abyss for the first time, starting with Floor 10. Oh, Deluke, knocking him away. All right, that wasn't great, but it's Pyro Shields and stuff. These guys are gonna get controlled. Just saving energy. No need to get fancy. 50? Why are we saying 50? Can I ask a question? 50. Oh, AR 50. <laughs> All right, I'll change it in a second. Later, bro. Floor 10s are getting washed. They're getting rolled. They're getting absolutely rolled. Man, there are people that even doubted floor freaking 10 and 11. Holy, dude. <laughs> Get King Obliterated! I was pressing A too fast. I got clapped. 
Oh my god, let's go, dude. While floors 9 and 10 were a cakewalk, I had heard that the Mirror Maidens on floor 11 were extremely annoying, but nothing was going to stop me today. Oh, it's a ley line one. <laughs> Goofies. What's the character you guys said I, I needed? Normally, I don't like to talk about the view count, but that's always been a dream of mine. So, hey, thank you, homies. You guys are going to be a part of something special today. I'll just tell you that much, baby. Let's fucking go. fast as I would have liked, but let's just see how we do here. Chamber three. It's the one people have been saying is annoying. Let's see what we can do, man. I want a mastery. I'll take that. <sighs> Bring it on, maiden. what it all came down to though it's floor 12 from clearing floors 9 through 11 we got extra mora and artifacts so we used those to make any small improvements we possibly could but now with no other options to exhaust we rode into floor 12. thank you guys for being a part of this let's go The first thing we're met with is the Abyss cards, a team-wide buff you receive for the Abyss that day. The buffs they give are completely random and can range from amazing to useless. Unfortunately, our Chamber 1 buffs were pretty mediocre, but we took our bonus attack and stayed focused. Chamber 1 took a lot of trial and error to get down. If you have ever fought these two, you will know that the Construction Specialist mechs are an absolute pain. Sure, they apply cryo to you, slowing you down and wasting your energy, but their erratic movement is what makes them pure hell. If they didn't stay grouped, it was an instant reset. Learning how to manipulate their AI to keep them together took a lot of testing. By staying in the middle of them, it does an all right job of keeping them grouped, but with Yai Miko needing to use her skill and naturally dodging attacks, it caused some issues. The chance of them starting to move after a dash and registering you as not in between them for even a second would result in them splitting up. After about 45 minutes of testing, we were able to consistently keep them grouped for about the first 30 seconds or so, but after that, it was up to chance. The next wave of enemies, the large over 
Overgrown Breacher Primus were simple, but not any less annoying. They stood relatively still, making it simple enough to group them, but they were unbelievably tanky and did way more damage than the mechs. So eye framing well with bursts and knowing when to go in and out were crucial. After this floor, we would have our first annoying snake of the challenge, the Ruined Serpent. For the Ruined Serpent, there isn't too much to say. It's a boss that actively wastes your time by burrowing underground, so using every single second you have available when it surfaces is everything. There's a few RNG moves that waste an absurd amount of time and practically kill the run by themselves, and it periodically charges up a big attack that it can be knocked out of and then stunned, but the hitboxes on it are wonky and can sometimes go undestroyed by a barrage of attacks also killing the run. So this was doable, but not gonna be easy. In the end, we were able to clear Chamber 1 with two stars very consistently, and if we somehow got perfect RNG with the mechs and the Ruin Serpent, I think there was a chance at three stars. Let's just get all the rewards in the Mora. This will help us level shit up a lot. But this entire challenge's true final boss lied in Chamber 2, the Satek Wina. A snake even more annoying, even harder to kill, and even less considerate about your time. To beat the Wina, we were going to need tons of practice versus it. So for the moment, two stars on Chamber 1 was fine. We need some practical experience on Chamber 2. Side 1 of Chamber 2 is nothing too complicated. The first two enemies are an Aramite Stone Enchanter and Gale Hunter, then a second wave with an Aramite Floral Ring Dancer and Scorching Lore Master. All of these Aramites summon their Beast Companion to fight along with them. Luckily, when you kill the beasts, which are way less tanky, they take a ton of damage and enter a weakened state. The only problem is that with the combination of them and their beasts attacking you all at once, dying is a pretty common occurrence. The goal was to take down the beasts first while keeping them all grouped so that they all take the AoE damage of Beto and our overloads. So once again, while they weren't easy, there weren't too many tricks they could throw at you, but side two was where the real enemy was. We not an enemy completely dreaded by the Genshin community at large. As I alluded to earlier, it burrows underground to waste as much of your time as possible, but follows a consistent pattern. Two random attacks, a laser move, one random attack, then it's floating state, where it charges up a large attack, but if you're able to hit two of these green balls with a swirlable element, the Wii Nut falls to the ground, has its resistances lowered, and is stunned for around 10 seconds. But the random attack patterns, burrowing underground, and aerial swirl mechanics is a perfect cocktail for a bad time. Headache or not, we were here to grind and practice how to clear this floor as fast as possible, so we did. Yeah, uptime right now, Xing Cho is just, that's what's trolling the run. My time right now is just really dog shit, but it's all right. Despite our best efforts, the Wii Nut was taking an incredibly long time. I knew this was going to be the hardest enemy in the entire run, but even I was starting to wonder if we bit off more than we could chew. Oh my god, Kuki is choosing to hit his tail. She's aiming the attack at a different spot than where I'm standing and just causing all my shit to miss. I eventually knew it was going to be better for us in the long run if we moved on from Chamber 2 to Clear Chamber 3, but it was with a pitiful zero-star clear. Well, I still get stuff. I saw the weaknesses in my play and our team, though, so we would be back with a new mindset. Chamber 3 was surprisingly the easiest of the three. Side 1 was two waves of the same thing, an Assault Specialist mech 
and a suppression specialist mech. The strategy here was very simple. Focus down the suppression mech as it used a gun and would keep its range if you didn't approach it, while the assault mech was a melee enemy and would come to you, keeping them grouped. They were really not a big deal at all. They were just tanky as hell since Chamber 3 always has level 100 enemies. In the final chamber of the Abyss was the Aeon Blight Drake, the enemy that forced us to bring a bow character on our side two teams. The Blight Drake is a straightforward enemy as well, luckily. Hit the points on his wings with a charge attack to knock him down and just wail on him otherwise. The only annoying thing about the Drake is that it periodically gains massive resistance to the element it's taken the most damage from, which will obviously be Dendro in our case, slowing us down dramatically. At this point though, we had nothing left to lose, it was time to see what we were capable of on floor 3. Oh my god, Deluke pushes these guys? <laughs> well, that unfortunately changes like everything. Yeah, man, the fucking energy on Xing Cho. That is literally just deciding fucking everything, man. After hours of grinding the abyss, throwing everything I had into each and every floor, I knew with where the teams were at right now, 36 stars was just out of reach. So we cleared floor three with two stars. I had technically done it. I had beaten floor 12 of the abyss in just three weeks with 31 stars, no less. But as you can see, this was not the face of someone who thought they'd won because my goal for this entire challenge was to achieve undeniable victory, to climb to the top of the highest peak Genshin Impact has 36 stars in just three weeks. We still had a day until servers went down. There were 24 hours left to concoct any upgrades, optimizations, and team changes that I could. I was not going to go down without a fight. I came all this way and sacrificed so much time to beat this, even if it was just 24 hours, I was not giving up. I feel like we learned a lot. After piloting the teams on floor 12, I knew what the main problems were. Believe it or not, it wasn't the overload team. Yai, Miko, Deluke, and Chevris were performing at an insanely high level for just three weeks. I could not have been happier with how they ended up. Beto, on the other hand, was very underwhelming though. Her build just wasn't there offensively, but in all honesty, that was fine. She was applying Electro and doing a bit of damage. I couldn't ask for much else from that slot right now. The biggest problem actually lied in the Hyper Bloom team. And believe it or not, from one of the goats of Genshin Impact, Xing Cho. Xing Cho is truly one of the best characters in the entire game. But the standard Xing Cho you might be thinking of in your head right now is probably C6 or at least C2 with an R5 Sack Sword or Fav Sword and with some pretty well-balanced stats of crit and energy recharge to boot. Our three-week-old Xing Cho though was struggling to live up to his god status. His damage was really bad, but at the end of the day, that wasn't even the problem. The biggest roadblock Xing Cho had was his energy. He was always short just a few energy and not able to consistently burst every rotation, meaning we couldn't apply enough hydro, leading to no blooms, and most importantly, no hyper blooms. And we thought we had this all planned out. He was on an ER sword with an ER sands and on four piece Emblem Sever Fate. I just couldn't believe he still wasn't there yet with everything we had for him. We debated switching Sack Sword off of DMC to Xing Cho, but with how inconsistent Sack Sword procs are at R1 and how it would negatively affect DMC's ability to apply Dendro, it didn't seem like the miracle cure. For two hours following the Abyss run, I grinded all the Mora and EXP books I could while running through the team scenarios over and over in my head. I didn't want to give up, but after everything we'd done today, I was exhausted. I tried to stay focused and stay awake, but with the physical and mental fatigue mixed with disappointment, I couldn't even keep my eyes open any longer. I needed to log off. The viewers of the stream had luckily not given up either, leaving me with a lot of words of encouragement. But I wasn't done yet. 
I went upstairs to have dinner, and after getting some food in my system, I was starting to feel a lot better. I immediately got to theory crafting with Mike about what we could possibly do in just one night. We just don't have any resources left, so leveling up a different character or weapon was legitimately impossible. All we had were the leftovers of random characters we obtained along the journey, stuck at level 20. What could we possibly do with just Yep, Barbara. She was the only character we had that could potentially save the run. Shing Cho getting replaced by Barbara this late into the challenge was unfathomable, but it is almost comical just how useful Barbara was to the team, even at level 20. Shing Cho was having trouble applying enough hydro with his burst uptime, while Barbara is a hydro catalyst, meaning she applies infinite amounts of hydro with her normal attacks. Besides that, all Shing Cho was doing extra was providing some, albeit mediocre, damage to the team. While Barbara is a perfect user of the four-star artifact set, Instructor, a simple set that reads, upon triggering an elemental reaction, increases all party members' elemental mastery by 120 for eight seconds, which ups each and every Hyper Bloom's damage by about 2,000 just by itself. And by sheer dumb luck, one of the few weapons that survived the cull for weapon EXP was an R5 Thrilling Tales. Barbara's character level and talents didn't matter in the slightest since we don't need healing for 412, and if we dodge well, her low health won't be an issue. The only problem was, I didn't have a four-piece instructor set anymore. I truly wiped out the coffers of this account before the run today. So there was only one option available to me, to stay up till 1 a.m. and grind elite enemies for two and a half hours. Farming elite enemies gives Mora, so I can afford leveling up characters and a few artifacts tomorrow, but most importantly, they have a small chance to drop instructor artifacts. That's right. I was banking on getting the final instructor piece I needed, a circlet or a goblet, off this small chance. But I did just that and grinded into the night with the most supportive girlfriend in the world at my side for moral support. I finished farming elites and went to log off, but remembered I still hadn't gotten the instructor goblet and went right back in. It was past midnight and I was seeing things, all right? I forgot to switch OBS back to the game screen, but I can promise you I got the final instructor piece. You can even see me say to Alina, I got it, and go into Barbara's stat screen through my glasses. Now it was finally time to go to bed, to get a good night's sleep before what was quite literally our final chance tomorrow, the Barbara Gamble. Na, 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 na. I started the stream as early as I could and dramatically announced to the stream everything I had mapped out today for our last hurrah. Raising Deluke's normal to level 6, Yai Miko's burst to level 6, and her level to 80. Ascending Chevrus one more time and getting her to level 80 to go from 33k HP to 39k HP. Raising DMC's level as much as we possibly could, getting Sack Sword to level 90, and of course, revealing the ace up our sleeve, Barbara. But not after, of course, doing some final ride gamba. How about we all this pull real quick, huh? <laughs> Huge! Oh my God! Level 40 Thrilling Tales! Let's can go dude and as a little bonus we even got a widsit refinement with the last of our pulls as a last ditch effort i overnight shipped some of the dawn winery's finest whiskey to help take the edge off then we gave it our all to achieve the dream run of getting 36 stars in just three weeks let's go guys Energy recharge! Way better than the 20% attack we got yesterday.
All right, Rune Serpent. Play nice, bro. Play nice. Kuki completely whiffed, bro. And DMC whiffs, which is all her energy. Bro, that went so fucking bad. I noticed that when I go and jump into them, it stops them with the IA. Which is big. That was the best run we had. Oh man, her energy's so bad. Got boomerang. That was less than a minute and a half. Let's get a star off the nut. <laughs> he does the one attack that doesn't let me heal the team. <laughs> okay, we are, uh, yeah, we're not gonna do that Barbara bullshit. This is the worst RNG you can get. I'm playing this really bad. I wish I just had more practice against the Wii Nut in general. It, it just sucks because I don't. Dude, I got locked out of him twice. Okay. Obviously that's bad. Here we go. I mean, all in all, these are good cards.
There's the warning chat that the end is near. I'm I'm in I'm perma stun locked where I think each and every floor it's possible to get out one more star. Which one do we can choose for the last hour? That's a good run, man. This is like very close. Victory is a mindset. Holy shit, based. Okay. All right, let's go try and beat the Wiener. to beat this fucker. It ain't over till they kick us out. chat no one could tell me i didn't try my goddamn hardest all right <laughs> no one could say i wasn't out here grinding till the last king moment 
And no one, nobody, could say that this challenge was easy. I chose the hardest banners on a hard ass abyss with some really annoying ass mobs, bad four stars, because I wanted to challenge myself, man. And I really did, okay? Maybe I was a little, uh, little too in over my head, perhaps. But dudes, I gave that shit my all, man. Every single day, I was live here, seven hours, eight hours, nine hours. That was a tough ass abyss, bro. After four and a half hours of the abyss, time was up. We were booted from the server and the challenge was over in an instant. Words can't really describe what I was feeling at that moment. A mix of accomplishment and disappointment, joy and sorrow. I really feel like I gave it my all and did something amazing, win or lose. With a challenge lasting over 165 hours, all being streamed live with hundreds of different paths and decisions we could have made, looking back, I can see a lot of the things that led to this result. I think the first was expecting to get four decent DPS builds for four different characters. Yai Miko, Fischl, Beto, and Xingqiu. Yai Miko was honestly cooking for a three week build, but the other three were downright bad. I saw something like this coming and wisely used Hyper Bloom and Overload, two comps that don't need crit stats to succeed, but instead of choosing sub DPSs for the team, I probably would have done better using characters with more utility over damage. On the Hyper Bloom team, I think using Kale on Favbo would have served us a lot better. More energy for the team from Fav, Dendro Resonance, and more Dendro application would have really turned the tides. Ching Cho may have had enough energy that way, and Dendro MC, who was struggling to apply enough Dendro versus the Wii Nut, would have had some extra help. For the Overload team, Fischl could have swapped over, saving us time and effort on getting Beto, or even running something like Lisa on Fav Codex for the energy and defense shred to really help emphasize Yai, Miko, and Deluke's damage. Or even switching the teams of sides completely, since Yai and Deluke can consistently deal high damage to the Wii Nut, bringing Fischl along to shoot down the Drake, and then using an arc aligned character in the last slot of Hyper Bloom to take down the Primus's shield. The Barber Gambit on the final day, I still think was a viable option with my back against the wall. In hindsight, sticking with Xing Cho, giving him the Sack Sword and praying for procs, coupled with the ER Abyss card we got on the final day may have been enough for him to consistently burst. Who knows? But besides just the team stuff, I think I went a little bit overboard with the restrictions. I had this looming thought in the back of my head that the more lucky I got or the more shortcuts I used would discredit my run, making it less impressive. When in reality, it is extremely impressive to be able to pull something off like this, even on really strong banners or with re-rolling accounts for a five-star early or using co-op to speed up some grinding. All of those things I just mentioned are something that any player can do. They're not exploits or cheating the game in any way. They're strategies that are available to any player at any time for free. And I psyched myself out, making me think that my run wasn't gonna be as legit if I did any of them. And I think that was stupid. So the challenge ended with us clearing floor 12 of the abyss, 31 stars in three weeks with a playtime of 165 hours and 40 minutes. But even with the shortcomings, this experience was completely unforgettable. It was one of the most fun times I've had playing Genshin in my entire life. Starting from scratch again, free to play, trying to conquer the game in just a few weeks was nothing short of exhilarating. Every single pull had so much weight to it that I actually had fun with the gacha again, instead of being jaded about getting C34 Noel on my way to C7 Kaching. And the amount of love and support I got from everyone in the live stream was something I will never forget. Even though we came up short, this adventure was incredible. So that begs the question, am I ever going to try this challenge again? Why don't you subscribe to find out? I'll leave you with this, though. Really, Hoyaverse? No skip button? Seriously? Do you have any idea how much time...